so I was actually just back in Connecticut at my high school for the first time in years recently and chatting with some of my successors about where I made my way in life and what I really didn't do actually in high school. In fact, I gave a talk about all of the studies that I didn't discover when I was back in high school um, because I still remember kind of wandering around the, the hallways when I was last there, uh, looking in on various classrooms where I'd spent a lot of time, that there was one in particular that I spent no time in, um, and that was the computer science lab. I still vaguely remember kind of peeking through the glass of the window when some of my friends were taking the, their introductory computer science classes, but I had no interest in it, honestly. I, I just assumed it was all about programming and like C++ or Java, whatever those were. But it just didn't seem all that interesting to me. And anytime I did look in, all my friends had like their heads down, kind of typing away, doing whatever it was they were doing. And so I focused on like history and English and constitutional law was my favorite class in high school. And so when I got to Harvard some years later, I kind of just stuck with where I was comfortable. Um, I felt like, well, I hadn't studied CS in high school. So all the other students who are taking CS here surely have a leg up and know way more than me. So I figured out I kind of uh, thought of it too late. And there was this course, CS50, my first year here. And it, you know, it had this alluring reputation. There were a lot of students in it. But it really didn't seem like it was for me. I wasn't really a computer person in that way. And I felt like I was behind. I, I didn't want to hurt my GPA by taking something so unfamiliar to me. And so I stayed within my comfort zone. And I took more history and government classes. And I sort of declared my major to be, or concentration, to be government. And it wasn't until sophomore year when I finally got up the nerve to, to shop, so to speak, sit in on a class before you officially register this class called CS50, and I only got up the nerve to register for it officially because the professor at the time let me sign up for it pass-fail. So no harm to the GPA. I was really able to explore really well beyond my, my comfort zone. And honestly, within weeks, I realized for the first time in like 18 years that homework can actually be fun. Um, and if you find the field that's of interest to you, whether it's CS or anything else, by exploring things that you're not familiar with right now, you might have the same experience I did of going home on like a Friday night, the problem set or homework assignment had just been released at like 7 PM every Friday night. And I would spend the entire evening um, on my laptop working on CS50's programming assignments because I finally realized what it was. And programming itself is not the ends of a course like this. It really is just about problem solving. And so quickly did I realize, wow, I can use these kinds of ideas to go solve problems in other courses, to be more efficient, to be more creative. Uh, in my extracurriculars, I realized, wow, I could now build some application to now uh, make uh, processes uh, more easily accessible on campus, like the intramural sports program was I able to overhaul just with a little bit of computer science. And if we kind of distill today what took me all too long to discover, um, problem solving really is kind of a picture like this, where you have some inputs and the goal is to achieve some outputs. And that, in some sense, really is computer science. And programming and a lot of the particulars that you learn in the classroom are really just deeper dives into this very simple idea. But how do you get to that point of actually solving problems? Well, I eventually realized that you needed to do two things. One, you needed to represent these inputs and these outputs. That is, we just all have to agree how to do it. And then you actually have to do something with those inputs to get those outputs. And therein lies the, the problem solving. And so how do you go about representing information? Well, you know, I could represent information you know, all I need is some kind of input, right? And here's the power cord to my laptop. And honestly, even if you have no idea how your computer works, odds are you appreciate that this is pretty integral, having somehow electricity, some physical input come into the computer. And if you unplug it, it's off. If you plug it in, it's on. And batteries, of course, can persist this here too. But off and on maps really cleanly to what you all probably generally know to be true of computers and that they only speak what language? You know, binary, by meaning two, mapping to this concept of off and on, or as a computer scientist would say, zero or one. Right? That's why we have zeros and ones at the end of the day, because the simplest thing to do electrically is to either turn the power on or turn the power off, one or zero. We could have called it A and B, but we call it one and zero. But if all you have in a computer is the ability to sort of turn it on or turn it off or to store some value, kind of like a light switch goes on or off, how can you possibly do anything interesting or solve problems, well, let's just consider like a simple a light bulb here, right? This has some power. It happens to have a battery. And if this thing is off, we'll just call it a zero. And if this thing is on, we'll call it a one. 
So now we have a single switch, or what's known in computing as a transistor. In fact, inside of your computer are lots and lots, millions of transistors that just turn things on and off. Well, if I have just one of these, I can only do 0 or 1. That's not all that interesting. That would seem to give us two problems total to solve. So, how can we count higher than just 0 or 1? Well, I might take two of these or three of these and maybe start doing things a little more methodically. So, I could do 1, 2, 3. So now I can clearly count as high as three, but that would seem to be it as well. But no, computers are a little smarter than that, and we can actually adopt patterns of on and off, right? So this now I'll claim is zero. All three of these light bulbs are off. Let me turn on this one on, thereby representing what I'm going to call a one. But you know what? Now I'm going to go ahead and claim that that's how a computer would store two. It would turn a different light switch on, the second one. And you know what? If it turns the first one back on, this is how a computer stores a three. And now, just take a guess. If I do this <laughs> uncomfortably, what is the computer perhaps now storing? Four. This happens to be six. This is now seven. Why? Like, how did I choose those particular patterns? Well, it turns out this is something that all of us are probably really familiar with. If you think about our sort of grade school understanding of numbers, if I draw something on the screen, quite simply, like this pattern of symbols, one, Two, three. This is, of course, 123. But why? Because all of us just pretty instantaneously did the mental arithmetic of this being the ones place, this is the tens place, this is the hundreds place. And then what did you probably do in that split second? Well, you did like 100 times 1 plus 10 times 2 plus 1 times 3, which of course gives you 100 plus 20 plus 3, or 123. Now, that's a bit of a circular argument because that's kind of where I started. But now these symbols, these、uh, curves on the screen, 1, 2, 3, Actually, have now meaning that we've all agreed represents the human number 123. So, computers are actually fundamentally the same thing, and in some sense, they're even simpler than us humans in the following way. If you have the same number of placeholders, and we write down <laughs> with great difficulty, if we write down, say, three places. Or three light bulbs, if you will, but doing it now textually. And I write down, for instance, 0, 0, 0. You can probably guess that in the world of computers, if you've got three switches that are all off, this represents the number 0. And if I turn one of these light bulbs on, so to speak, this, of course, as before, is going to be the number that I called 1. Well, if I now do not just change this one, But change this to a zero, and this is where maybe my light bulb patterns got a little non obvious. Why is this two? Well, it's the same mental arithmetic, but just with different places. A computer doesn't use powers of 10, so to speak, 10 to the zero, 10 to the one, 10 to the two, but powers of two. So this is two to the zero, or the one's place. This is two to the one, or the two's place. This is two to the two, or the four's place. And so you just need to turn these light bulbs on and off based on this kind of pattern to get whatever number it is you're interested in. So this is 2 because it's 4 times 0 plus 2 times 1 plus 1 times 0. Why is this 3 when I turned two light bulbs on earlier? The same reasoning. And what's the highest I can count with just three light bulbs or three zeros and ones? Seven, just because you got a four plus a two plus a one and so forth. And what would happen then if I wanted to count as high as eight, would you think? Yeah, you need to add another place, or really, you need more physical hardware. And this is why your computer can only count so high or store so much information. You need an additional light switch or another transistor, if you will, to actually store additional information. So that then is binary. If you've just kind of known intuitively computers to only speak zeros and ones, why? Well, that's because they start with electricity as their physical input. We humans have just all agreed to represent values in this way using binary by just having these patterns. Of zeros and ones. But that pretty much makes for a very expensive calculator if all you have are numbers. So, how do you get from numbers、uh, and from electricity to now letters, say, of the alphabet? What could we do? How do we now enable spreadsheet programs and word processors and text messaging and email clients and the like? What can we all do if our only input is electricity or, in turn, zeros and ones? Say again? Yeah, we can just assign number values to letters. So, you know what we could go ahead and do? And if we want to represent letters of the alphabet, as before, the only goal at hand is to just agree on how to represent that information. So, let's pick a few letters of the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. 
We could just say, you know what? Let's just agree to represent A as 1 and B as 2 and C as 3. Doesn't really matter so long as we all agree to do that. But it turns out some years ago, humans decided that A is actually going to be 65 and B is 66 and C is 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 73. And so forth. This is known as ASCII or Unicode. It's just a system that humans agreed decades ago shall be used by computers to represent letters of the alphabet just by storing numbers. And those numbers, in turn, are just the result of the computer turning little switches, known as transistors, on and off in these certain patterns. And let me, with a wave of a hand, assure that we can represent colors and sounds and videos in very similar ways, but we need to actually just agree. On how to do this. So, in fact, there's an opportunity here perhaps to, to write a message in exactly the same way that a computer could.、Um, if you could humor me, maybe with like eight volunteers. Could we get some eight volunteers up in space? Okay, one, two. Let me look a little farther. Three,、uh, four. Can I go a little farther? I see no hands in the back. Okay. There we go. Five,、uh, six over there. I see someone pointing at someone else. Come on, seven. And let's go eight over here. Come on down. And I just need you to go ahead, if you could, and stand beneath these placeholders here on the slide, which I've gone ahead and rotated just so that they fit a little more visibly on the screen. Come on over. What's your name? Matt, come on over and stand under the 128. What's your name? Mira, David.、Hey. David, nice to meet you. Hello. David, nice to meet you. Anisha. Anisha, David, and Monica, nice to meet you. And what was your name? Shreyas, nice to meet you as well. So, each of these guys is going to have to scooch a little closer to each other. And you know what? If this isn't too much effort, could we actually get eight more volunteers? Now that you know what you're vo- Okay, now everyone's hand goes up. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if you could. Come on down. We'll do this round more quickly. And what you'll notice now that we have a byte's worth of volunteers here. What is a byte? A byte is just eight bits, it's a more useful unit of measure. Than just a zero or one. And notice the terminology here too a, bu- a bit. A zero or one is a binary digit. There's the etymology of just that simple phrase. And a quick hello to AJ. Ajay. David. AJ. David. Nice to meet you. 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 David. And nice to meet you as well. Here we have our second bite of humans. And what's that? We have a seven right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have a bug. Here we go. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. In computer science, that's an off by one error.、Uh, what's your name? Helen. Helen David. Nice to meet you. Go ahead and join, I guess, this group right here in the middle if you could. So these folks here, hopefully, do you have cell phones on you? Key detail I probably should have mentioned earlier. That's OK if you don't. That's right. That's OK. We're going we're gonna to recover. Whoever doesn't have a cell phone is now going to get a flashlight. OK. Let's do this. OK. Key detail. Sorry, you can go ahead and turn that off. I'm going to cross my fingers here that we have enough light bulbs. Hang on. Let's go ahead now and turn on, if you could, three light bulbs here. So do you, ha- you don't have your phone? Here is a nice X- iPhone XS. OK. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Let's go ahead and turn yours on. Can you share, swap phones for a moment? So we have two light bulbs there, and we don't need anyone else's phone on just yet. Could you turn your light bulb on? And could you turn your light bulb on? And we need just one light bulb here, if you could turn that on. So let me step out of the way, and you'll see that we have someone in the 64's place whose light is on in the 8's place, then again in the 64's place and the 8's place. And lastly, the one. So, if a computer indeed had some 16 switches or transistors inside of it and turned on those switches in this particular order, what message are these humans here representing at the moment? So, it's indeed high. Why? Because the mapping we arbitrarily chose but globally decided on is that 72 is H and 73 is I. Well, let's try one more further. At the moment, we're just using two bytes of humans, if you will, two units of eight. But suppose that we didn't just draw an imaginary line in between them and count only up to the one's place through the 128's place. But suppose that we treated everyone as one much bigger value so that we could count much higher. So now these humans are taking on the value of the 128th place, but then the 256, 512, 1024, 10, all I'm doing is multiplying by 2. I'm going to need one more volunteer, and I'll take on this role over here. If I were to be、uh, at the very end here, I now have 17 bits 
on stage, 17 switches or transistors. Let me go ahead and turn on just some of these if we could. Most of them we might have to borrow a couple of phones. Let's go ahead and give, if you could turn your phone on here, your flashlight. Let me,、uh, that's technically yours. Let me, can we borrow your phone for a moment? Okay, your phone is going over here <laughs> to the 32,000th place. We need to turn yours on. Okay, I'll turn mine on over there. So we need one, two. Can we give you three, four on? Can we borrow that? Three, four. Can we borrow,、uh, keep the phones coming? <laughs> three, four. So one, two, three, four. And then we skip one. And then we need you two to be on, if that's okay. And then over here, thankfully, we need just one light bulb on. So now it's your chance. If a computer were using this many bits, 16 bits, and if I stand in place now, 17 bits, where I represent 65,536, and our volunteers all the way on the end represents the number one, and you do this math, what number are we all representing? Okay, no one's going to get this right. It's 128,514. What might that message say? Well, there's not nearly enough clues in mind, but it's actually this. <laughs> so, if you've sent today or recently an email or a text message with an emoji, you might have sent this one, Face with Tears of Joy. So, that's its official name, but it's not an image per se, it's actually a character. And in fact, you might know that you have so many emojis these days, and that's because computers and humans who use them have started using way more than 8 bits. Way more than 16 or 17 bits, sometimes 24 or 32 bits, which gives us so many darn possible permutations of zeros and ones or switches being turned on and off that frankly it's just become kind of a cultural thing that we have so many darn possibilities. Let's start using some of them for more uh, uh, silly reasons, if you will, like emojis. So if you ever receive today or hereafter a face with tears of joy, what your friends have really sent to you is a pattern of zeros and ones somehow implemented with electricity or wavelengths. Of light that represents, rather mundanely, 128,514. So, if we could, a round of applause for our human volunteers here. Let me borrow this. Thank you. If you'd like to step off stage, we have a little something for each of you. So, we have just one last question to answer. Thank you all so much. We have just one other question to answer, which is. If problem solving ultimately boils down to representing inputs and outputs, what is the process that we pass those inputs through in order to get those outputs? What is it you learn ultimately in a course on computer science? Well, it's perhaps best explained by way of a problem. So here's an old school problem where you have a whole bunch of names and numbers alphabetically sorted from A through Z, and you want to find someone. And even though this is pretty old school, It's honestly the same thing as the address book or the contacts app that you have in your own iPhone or Android phone or any particular device, right? If you scroll through your contacts, odds are they're A through Z, alphabetized by first name or last name. So this is just representative of the same problem that you and I solve anytime we look someone up in our phone. Well, if I want to look up an old friend, someone like Mike Smith, last name starting with S, I could certainly just start at the beginning of this book and do one, two, three, four. And that's a step by step process, otherwise known as an algorithm. And is that algorithm correct? Will I find Mike Smith? Yeah, I mean, it's a little tedious and it's a little slow, but if Mike is in here, I'll eventually find him. But I'm not going to do that, right? That, I know he's going to be roughly at the end. So maybe a little more intelligently or efficiently, I could do two, four. Six, eight, ten, twelve, and so forth. It's going to fly me through the phone book twice as fast. And is that algorithm or step by step process correct? A little contention, right? It's almost correct, except if I get unlucky and might get sandwiched between two pages because I'm a little aggressively flying through the phone book, but no big deal. If I maybe hit the T section, I could. Maybe double back like one or few pages and fix that. But none of us are going to do that. What's a typical person going to do? And really, what's a computer going to do, be it in your phone or a laptop these days? Yeah, it's going to go roughly maybe to the middle or a little biased toward the right because you know S is a little alphabetically later than most letters. And I look down, for instance, here and I see, oh, I'm in the M section. Uh, and so I know that Mike is not this way. He's definitely this way. So, both metaphorically and, and, and literally, can I tear a problem like this in half? 
This is actually not that hard that vertically. I can tear the problem in half, and now I'm left not with 1,000 pages with which I began, but maybe 500. And I can do it again and whittle myself down to like 250 pages, and again, down to 125, and again and again and again until I'm left with hopefully just one or so page. But what's powerful about, honestly, that intuition that odds are you had when you walked in this door is that in just 10 or so steps, can you find Mike Smith in a phone book? In just 10 or so steps, can iOS or Android find someone in your contacts by dividing and conquering, dividing and conquering? Whereas the other algorithms might have taken, gosh, like 1,000 steps, 500 steps, almost as many pages as there are. And so that's an algorithm, and that's what's inside this proverbial black box. It's the sort of secret sauce and the ideas that you learn, not just to, to, not just to learn along the way, but learn to harness in your own human. Intuition. And so I wish I had discovered that far earlier for myself, knowing that computer science is not about pro programming per se. It really is about problem solving and just formalizing and kind of cleaning up your thought process and introducing you to ideas like this that you can then apply in so many different ways. So, that there, say, is just a taste of computer science. Allow me to conclude with a taste of this one course, CS50, by way of the point of view of one of our very own students.